Greetings, and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are in this section called Autumn Rivulets, and this is the fourth poem of the 38, Old Ireland. Now, as somebody whose last name is McGee, obviously I'm very interested in a poem like this. I'm also interested in the fact that this is the only time in all of Leaves of Grass that the word Ireland gets used. One time in Leaves of Grass, the word Irish gets used in Proud Music of Storm, and one time Irishmen will get used in Sleepers Section 7. And one of the obvious questions will be, what's going on with Whitman and the Irish? A lot of scholars have commented on this. Whitman himself was once reported to have said that he took always real, quote-unquote, comfort, end quote, in his many, quote, friends in Ireland, end quote. And we'll finish this lecture, in fact, with mentioning uh, three of those, and Oscar Wilde and James Joyce and, uh, and the great Yeats. Um, now, our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt, our playlist, and that you've been with us, hopefully, from the very beginning, that introductory word, come, all the way up to and including a set of comments that are introductory to Autumn Rivulets, and then we just finished with, there was a child went forth. Our Nortons, as we like to reference that information, says that this poem first appeared in the New York Leader, November 2nd, 1861, collected in drum taps, 1865, and remained unchanged in all Leaves of Grass editions. Some variants occur in the magazine text, for example, the phrase, an armed man, or after today, in the final line. The Finian Brotherhood, an Irish-American revolutionary society, was founded in the United States in 1858. In the decade 1851 to 1860, one and a half million Irish faced with famine and poverty, we know about the Great Potato Famine, Im immigrated to America, while the total remaining population of Ireland was less than six million. Now again, one of the questions that we'll ask is, why is there so little mention of the Irish in Leaves of Grass? This is, in fact, Whitman's only poem. It is surprising, given that the Irish were the largest group of working class immigrants during Whitman's New York years, right? Um, uh, um, um, a, a scholar, Craig, has pointed out in Whitman and the Irish that a full 30% of New York's population in 1855 were Irish by birth, uh, though Old Ireland is a sympathetic portrait of the Irish and the revolutionary organization, the Finian Brotherhood. Craig and others have wondered at Whitman's silence regarding the important population in this city. And, the, and scholars have pointed out any number of possibilities. Um, there's obviously mention of uh, and, and all kinds of tipping of the hat to the, to the, uh, to the Italians. But often not to the Irish, did he maybe see the, the, um, the Italians as maybe more sophisticated? It's hard, it's hard to know. It's not altogether clear, even in this poem, that Whitman is in fact celebrating anything having to do with Ireland. He'll, he'll say it this way. Uh, Far hence, amid an isle of wondrous beauty, crouching over a grave, an ancient sorrowful mother, once a queen, now lean and tattered, seated on the ground. Her old white hair drooping disheveled around her shoulders, at her feet fallen an unused royal harp. Long silent, she too long silent, mourning her shrouded hope and air. Of all the earth, her heart most full of sorrow, because most full of love. Yet a word, ancient mother, you need crouch there no longer on the cold ground with forehead between your knees. Oh, you need not sit there veiled in your old white hair so disheveled. For know you, the one you mourn is not in that grave. It was an illusion. The son you love was not really dead. The Lord is not dead. He's risen among young and strong in another country. Even while you wept there by your fallen heart by the grave, what you wept for was translated, passed from the grave. The winds favored and the sea sailed it. And now, with rosy and new blood, moves today in a new country. Now obviously, the poem is going to celebrate the idea that America has somehow been, uh, somehow transcended, uh, the trans word, the translate word is here, uh, and so it's going to be an interesting poem. What actually is this poem about? And obviously we're going to ask, why did it end up in Autumn Rivulets? And I think there is a good answer to that. I think there's a reason why Whitman would have this poem in a collection called Autumn Rivulets, because there's a whole bunch of old going on here. Notice, Old Ireland. 
Now, this far hence, I think, I've said to you guys, I think that T.S. Eliot was more influenced by, uh, by Whitman than he ever wanted to amend. Uh, you'll, you'll remember, of course, so uh, in, in uh, uh, Wasteland, oh, keep the dog far hence, that's friend of man, or with his nails, he'll dig it up again. Um, I've given full lectures on the, the works of T.S. Eliot, especially Wasteland and Four Quartets. And there, every once in a while, I would make that, arg that argument that I think Whitman's influencing a lot of the, even cadences, far hence amid an isle of wondrous beauty. So he begins by complimenting Ireland as being a beautiful place, which, of course, is impossible not, not to do. And then um, this use of crouching, which is the only use. By the way, far hence is only used one time in all leaves of grass. It's here as well. Crouching is only used one time in leaves of grass. It's right here. Crouching over a grave an ancient sorrowful mother. Now this is a fascinating word picture, right? Especially with the verb crouching. Once a queen, which makes it even more intriguing, once a queen, now lean and tattered, seated on the ground, her old white, notice the use of the word old, her old white hair drooping disheveled around her shoulders. It's a fascinating, fascinating image of a woman sitting next to an old woman with long hair, gray hair, uh, silver hair, disheveled um, next to the grave, sitting next to, to the grave, clearly l lugubrious, right? Now, obviously we can read this as literal, we can read this as what probably Whitman wants us to read it as, is in metaphysical or figurative, uh, metaphoric, right? Um, at her feet, notice, fallen an unused royal harp, and of course we cannot help but be impressed by the fact that Iliad 9 comes to mind when uh, Odysseus and his pals show up at the tent of Achilles to say, hey, we need you back. What is it that he's doing? Well, he's, of course, playing on an old instrument, a, a harp, and he's, of course, singing songs of old warriors. I've given full lectures on all of the books of the Iliad, but especially book 9 at LearnStrong.net if you want to run that to ground. Notice the next line, long silent, that is an interesting use of the word long along with the word old, she too long silent. In other words, both the harp has not been played, the, the instrument, obviously, of poetry. She too long silent, mourning her shrouded hope and air of all the earth, her heart most full of sorrow because most full of love. Again, the paradoxes that will be played out. Uh, you'll see a lot of paradoxes in autumn rivulets. If you'll think about it, that's that's interesting because autumn usually represents old, rivulets represents usually some kind of new growth as in a flowing river, maybe on its way to the ocean or the, to the sea. Then there's a break. So the first part of the poem is just painting a picture. That is to say, an old woman. Now obviously, we're gonna be playing around with Ireland as being old. In other words, an old woman who now no longer has the artistic talent, the harp is silent, no longer capable. Yet a word, ancient mother, and so now we're back to talks with Wall. In other words, Whitman now is going to want to speak to specifically this old woman, and obviously to Ireland, especially to old Ireland. You need crouch there no longer. So now we come back to the word crouch, and it's an interesting word because it's kind of a, it can be an, a, an, um, an um, you know, kind of an obscene word, right? That, it's not, a, it's not a, a, a nice word. You need crouch there no longer on the cold ground with forehead between your knees. It's an amazing image, right? Um, in other words, completely debased in every way. By the way, this idea of being debased in, on your knees is obviously an Iliad reference as well. Oh, notice the use of the word oh. Oh, you need not sit there veiled in your old, notice again the use of the word old, white hair so disheveled. In other words, what is he saying about Ireland? Well, it's a culture that's now grown old, right? Again, this poem, I, I'm not convinced that this is a celebratory poem for Ireland at all. For know you the one you mourn is not in the grave. Now this is interesting. And it may be that one of the, one of the problems that Whitman had with the Irish is obviously the strong Catholic background as opposed to his Protestant and Quaker uh, origins. It's possible, scholars have pointed this out, that maybe there's a bias there. But notice all of the religious language here, namely, of course, Matthew 28, 6, and this idea of not in the grave he is risen. We're going to get to that line in a second. It was an illusion. Um, that, um, now, this is, this is fascinating to me uh, for a number of counts. Um, um, uh, are you are you the new person who is drawn towards me? You'll remember that poem. The line went, "Have you no thought, O dreamer, that it may all that it may be all Maya illusion?" So here, the, his use of that word illusion is fascinating to me. It was an illusion. The son you love was not really 
dead, and this takes us immediately to, of course, uh, Luke 8.52. So he's making religious references to the resurrection, obviously, of, of Christ. The Lord is not dead. By the way, this use of the Lord takes us back to Song of Myself, passage 6, as well as Song of Myself, passage 45, and, and the Lord being used. You'll remember uh, the handkerchief of the Lord. The Lord is not dead. He is risen again, young and strong, in another country. So th there are a lot of readers of Whitman's Day that were deeply, deeply concerned about language like this and the use of this kind of religious Referencing, we're going to get to him that was crucified later. I think that you have several of, of the more controversial ideas in all of Leaves of Grass hidden, and I like that it is hidden. Uh, I like to use that word, that it is hidden in Autumn Rivulets. There are, there are people who have, who have asked me, hey, on your talks with Walt, well, once you get through, you know, uh, Blue Ontario, you, you're going to kind of pull the plug, maybe, you're, maybe you'll do passage uh, to India and you'll be, you'll be done. And I'm like... No, no, I think these poems are way more important than a lot of people want to give them credit, especially what he's trying to pull off. Notice, the Lord's not dead, he's risen. Again, young, as opposed to old, strong, in, uh, as opposed to weak, in another country. This other country will be referenced as a new country in the last two words of the poem. Even while you wept there, in other words, Ireland kind of gave up its artistic, its poetic, its creative uh, drive. Even while you wept there by your fallen heart, by the grave, what you wept for was translated. In other words, artistically, America has moved beyond Ireland, which is a pretty remarkable argument at the time that he's writing this poem. Passed from the grave. In other words, using messianic kind of imagery here, obviously it can be perceived as radically profane what he's doing. The winds favored and the sea sailed it. Um, and now, with Rosie, obviously takes us back to Homer and his you know, and, and, and Rosie, New Dawn, and all of that. And New Blood, as opposed to Old Ireland, New Blood moves today in a new country. Well, this is again why we argue that the new is the new, the N E W is the K N E W. In other words, somehow Ireland and the greatest poets have all been translated into American poets. I'm not convinced that Irish readers of this poem would be that uh, excited about the suggestion that Whitman's making that basically America has greater poets because the harp has grown silent in Ireland. And as, we, as we'll finish here in a second, there, there would be one or two Irish writers who maybe would have something to say about this. What are we going to say about a poem like this? Well, I think one obvious message is that America is the fulfillment of other countries' hopes and dreams. I mean, we've said that Whitman was very influenced by Hegel and his philosophy of history. And I think Whitman genuinely believed that America is the penultimate outgrowth, the translation of all of these other countries, and here now it's, it's Ireland. I think one of the other arguments is that true dreams, like artistic uh, per perfection, um, can never die. It just translates from one culture to another culture. Uh, at 2B, the rhetoric here, I'm amazed at the biblical allusions, and it is quite radical. I mean, he is risen as directly, of course, with the Lord being mentioned as a reference to, again, Matthew 28.6. Uh, and, and yet, it, it, it can come across as blasphemy, but probably to Irish readers, the greater blasphemy is what he's saying about Irish artists and Irish art, poetry especially. At 3A, it's interesting the number of places we can go here. I think of Tolkien and his Lord of Rings and the idea of the passage of time and therefore the loss of certain kinds of generational talent. I think of Beowulf as also being uh, the, the, the references to almost like an old, older Anglo-Saxon time period. The Iliad is, is mentioned already at Book 9, especially with the harp. And notice that music and, and, and music symbolism is all the way through the Iliad, and of course the Odyssey as well as the Aeneid. But now I want to get to the three great Irish writers. There's an amazing history of Whitman and Oscar Wilde that I'll let you run to ground on your own. Uh, but he was very, they, the two were obviously very, very interested in each other for any number of reasons. Um, I think of Joyce and his portrait of the artist as a young man. I think Joyce was very influenced uh, by Whitman. And Joyce's portrait of the artist, you'll remember that Stephen Dallas makes that argument that Ireland likes much like a, a, a pig eating its own, likes, Ireland likes to eat its own artists, which is why in the end of, the, of that famous novel he's going to leave Ireland because he can't be a poet and be Irish anymore. And of course, think about the power of, of Joyce's Ulysses and, uh, and the significance that that idea of Ulysses had on Whitman. 
But I want to think about Yeats, W.B. Yeats, and of course his classic, Sailing to Byzantium, think of it, 1928, what's the opening lines? That is no country for old men, the young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song. The salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas, flesh, flesh, or fowl come in all summer long. Whatever is begotten, born and dies, caught in that central music called neglect, monuments of unaging intellect. And I think that Yeats is definitely playing off of a poem like Old Ireland when he writes a poem like Sailing to Byzantium. Finally, at 3B, how are you going to own a poem like this? Well, it is interesting to ask, do you think that America is in fact the culmination of artistically all the other mm, cultural, uh, artistic productions in all the other cultures because we are this amazing melting pot, as de Tocqueville kind of referenced us in Democracy in America, and therefore we just kind of take all of the artistic um, um, dynamism, we might say dynamism, yeah, of, of other countries, and then we just kind of produce this American art form, or is it rather, for you, more a bastardization, and in fact, as many Irish would argue, Whitman was never able to accomplish what the great Irish poets and writers were able to accomplish. And then finally, what are your thoughts about why there is so little reference to Irish uh, people in Ireland in Leaves of Grass? I hope that you're continuing to be challenged with our study. Thank you.